All right, chemistry 3101, we left off looking at the factors that can affect reaction rate. And now we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail. So from your general chemistry 2 class, you probably remember seeing something like this, a rate law, where we say that rate is equal to K times the concentration of the reactants. And K is a rate constant, and the units of K uh, can vary depending on the order of the reaction. So the bottom line here is that the reaction rate, you can clearly see from the equation here, that the rate is going to depend on the rate constant K, and it's also going to depend on the concentration of the reactants, right? This is a direct relationship here. So the degree at which the change in the concentration of a reaction a reactant is going to affect the reaction rate. We know that as reaction order. And again, in general chemistry too, you would have learned the method of initial rates where you would compare different reactions and compare the rates and compare concentrations in order to determine a rate law. Well, we don't do that in organic chemistry. However, we do consider reaction order. So if we look at our reaction, okay, we have rate is equal to K, our rate constant multiplied by a to the power of x and b to the power of y, um, the exponents are have to be experimentally determined, again, using that met method of initial rates. But um, if we have our rate, let's say, and the rate is equal to k, our rate constant, multiplied the co by the concentration of only one reactant, right? And that's to the exponent of one. We just leave that out. It's implied. We call that a first-order reaction. Well, what would happen if we were to double the reaction or the re if we were to double the reactant concentration, what's going to happen is the rate is going to double, right? Let's think about it. If your rate is equal to K and let's say K is one multiplied by one molar, well, then your rate is going to be equal to one. If you're if you change the concentration to two, well, then your rate is going to double, right? Makes sense. OK, well, what if you have a reaction rate that's dependent on both the concentrations of A and B and both to the exponent of one, which is implied. We just leave it out. Well, what's going to happen if you double the concentration of A? It's going to double the reaction rate. If you double the concentration of B, the same thing is going to occur. All right, let's say you have K or rate is equal to K, which is one multiplied by the concentration of A, which is one times one. Well, then your rate is going to be equal to one. If you were to double the concentration of B, then your rate is going to be equal to 2, right? So the same rationale there. However, if you have one of your reactants to the exponent 2, okay? So that means it's second order with respect to A. What's going to happen if you double that? Well, then you'd have 2 squared, which is, means it's going to go up four times. It's going to quadruple. Again, these reaction orders have to be experimentally determined. And in general... When we have a big K, we have a fast reaction. And when we have a small K, we have a slow reaction. Well, let's go back to those factors that affect the rate constant. You remember activation energy? If we look at a reaction coordinate, right, the re activation energy is that minimum amount of energy that's required in order for an effective molecular collision to result in a chemical reaction. So if we have our reactants, right, the reactants are going to collide in a reaction. You can't see what I'm doing. I'm showing my two fists colliding. But anyhow, they're going to collide. But remember, if they collide, oh, but they don't have quite enough energy, right? If they collide, pow, but they still don't have quite enough energy, they've got to collide with sufficient energy to get to the top of the roller coaster, so to speak. And then from there, it's a downhill trip to the products in this um, exergonic process here. But the bottom line is that minimum amount of energy to get to the top here to result in an effective collision, that's what we call the activation energy. It's the energy barrier between the reactants and the products. As the activation energy increases, okay, the number of molecules possessing enough energy to react decreases. If we look at the Boltzmann distribution, and that's what this curve is here, it's the Boltzmann distribution of the um, amount of energy of all of the um, molecules, okay, um, at a certain temperature, only some of the molecules will have the minimum energy required to produce a reaction, right? Again, if we look at the Boltzmann distribution, if this is our activation energy here, 
you can see that only the molecules in the shaded area are going to have that necessary energy, right? What happens if we increase the activation energy, right? If we were to raise the energy barrier even higher, well, then you're going to have an even smaller number of molecules that have the necessary energy, okay? And if you were to decrease the activation energy, let's say you dropped it all the way down to here, if this is your new activation energy, you're going to have more successful collisions, right? You're going to have a faster reaction. Well, that talks about the activation energy, and we just looked at what would happen if you were to increase or decrease the activation energy. Um, so if we were to look at that on a reaction coordinate, and we're just looking at the activation energy here, and this is basically just you know, going over what I just talked about, you can see that as the activation energy increases, right, we get a slower rate, right, because it's a higher en energy barrier for the reactants to overcome. Now, what about the temperature? Well, what happens when we increase the temperature is we're going to end up with a faster reaction. Why are we going to end up with a faster reaction? Because if you look at the Boltzmann distribution, when we increase the temperature, you see that it shifts over to the right. Okay, and with that shift over to the right, if our activation energy is in the same spot, well, now we have a bigger shaded in area. So we have a higher number of molecules that possess the necessary energy to overcome that minimum energy barrier in order to produce an effective collision, in order to produce a reaction. So to recap, at a higher temperature, you're going to have molecules that have a greater kinetic energy. And so more molecules are going to have enough energy to produce a reaction. So as we increase the temperature, the reaction rate's going to increase. What did we see in the last part? We said that as we increase the activation energy, the reaction rate is going to decrease. What about the steric considerations? This is something that we're going to look at more in chapter seven. But the bottom line is that not only do molecules have to collide with sufficient energy, they have to co collide in the proper orientation or what we call a reactive conformation. Uh, it says here, if the reactive conformation of a compound is high energy, it's going to spend less time in that conformation. And so the probability of a collision resulting in a reaction is low. But the bottom line is that we have to have our molecules lined up in the correct orientation. So it's not just any old collision that's got enough energy that's going to produce a reaction. We have to take into consideration how or the orientation of the molecules as they collide. And that, again, is something that we're going to look at in a lot of detail in Chapter 7. So you really just have to know that there is a steric consideration, and then we'll take a bigger or a more in-depth look at it, more in-depth look at it in Chapter 7. Uh, catalyst. This is something that you would have learned in general chemistry one and talked about in general chemistry two. How does a catalyst speed up the rate of a reaction? What it does is it lowers the activation energy. So here's our activation energy without a catalyst. All the catalyst does is just makes a smaller activation energy. But when it does that, it almost always provides a new pathway. So you see how there's all kinds of different humps and bumps here. And we'll talk about what those humps and bumps are in a second. But it's a different pathway and it's got a lower activation energy. OK, so that's how a catalyst speeds up a reaction or that's how a catalyst affects the reaction rate. Now, with all that in mind, I want to remind you that kinetics and thermodynamics are completely different concepts. OK, you've got to have those things separated in your mind. Something like kinetics is related to activation energy, right? We said, OK, if the react activation energy is high, the reaction is going to be slow. If it's low, the reaction is going to be fast, right? Kinetics is the rate of reaction, whereas thermodynamics, thermodynamics deals with the equilibrium concentrations of reactants and products. We saw how thermodynamics was related to delta G, right? And delta G is tied to equilibrium constant. So we have equilibrium and then we have the rate of reaction. We have thermodynamics and we have kinetics. I mean, I could sit here and talk about kinetics and thermodynamics all day, but the bottom line is, is that you've got to have those two things separate in your mind, and you've got to understand the difference between the two, kinetics and thermodynamics. And that's basically what we've done up until this point. Well, if you have a reaction between two reactants, A and B, 
what if they could react a couple of different ways? Okay, what if they could, could combine to form C and D? Or what if they could also combine to form E and F? Okay, well, you see here that there's two different pathways, aren't there? There's one pathway, the one that's highlighted in blue, that produces products C and D, whereas the other one produces E and F. Now, what if we evaluate the formation of these products in terms of kinetics and thermodynamics? You can see that the bottom line here says the formation of C and D, so these two products here, are both kinetically and thermodynamically favored. Now, why is that? The reason why is because in terms of kinetics, you can see that the activation energy for the formation of C and D is significantly lower than the activation energy here. I'm going to erase this. But you see how the activation energy for um, E and F is much higher. So there we go. So in terms of kinetics, the formation of C and D is preferred. Why? Because it has a lower activation energy. Now, why is the formation of C and D also thermodynamically preferred? Because it's got a lower delta G, right? If we compare the reactants to the products, you see that the delta G here, okay, going from here to here, the delta G is more negative than the delta G is from here to here, okay? So again, I'm repeating myself, but the reaction that forms C and D is both kinetically and thermodynamically favored. This is a question I'm just looking at my notes here while I'm talking. I have a note here that this is a question that came up on an ACS final exam a number of years ago. You know, it said, okay, what about C and D? Is it kinetically favored? Is it thermodynamically favored? Is it both kinetically and thermodynamically favored? Right? And so the answer, of course, is this right here. The formation of C and D is both kinetically and thermodynamically favored. So that might beg the question, you know, are there situations where the formation of a product might be kinetically favored, but not thermodynamically favored? And the answer is absolutely. Okay, let me show you an example. Now, if we have the formation of E and F and C and D uh, formed again from A and B, <clears throat> but we look at these two pathways, you can see that the formation of E and F is actually kinetically favored, isn't it? Why? Because it's got a lower activation energy. Maybe I should use red here to be consistent. Here, I'll use red because I'm referring to the red line here. But you see how the activation energy here is lower. So that means this is going to be kinetically, kinetically favored, the formation of E and F. But what about thermodynamics? Right? In terms of my thermodynamics, the formation of E and F isn't favored, is it? It's the formation of C and D. That's got a lower delta G. They're both exergonic processes, but the delta G here is more negative, therefore thermodynamically favored. So then you might be asking, well, which one's going to happen? Now you've got two pathways. One's, one's good in terms of kinetics, and the other one's better in terms of thermodynamics. So in this kind of situation, which arises all the time in organic chemistry, temperature is going to play um, a pivotal role here, okay? If you crank up the temperature high enough, you're going to give more of the molecules the necessary activation energy to overcome or to achieve the activation energy necessary to form the more thermodynamically stable products. And that's something that, again, we're going to discuss more later on in the class, but I just want you to be aware that this situation can definitely arise. And again, you need to understand what's going on here, uh, that one pathway is kinetically favored, the other one is thermodynamically favored, and I can ask you some questions about that. Well, as we progress through the course, you're going to see a lot of potential energy reaction coordinate diagrams. And you can see, remember a few slides ago, I showed you the um, alternate pathway for the um, uh, catalytically you know, modified uh, pathway. Okay, well, whatever. The bottom line is that you saw, you know, you had some humps here, the, the valleys, you got these peaks, you got these maxima and minima on the way from your reactants to your products. It's not just a straight shot, right? It wasn't just a woo and then down like that. Sometimes you have these kind of pathways here. And these maxima, we call these transition states. And the minima, we call these intermediate. So again, the maxima, 
those are the transition states in the minima or valleys. We call these intermediates. Now, the textbook goes into some funny analogies sometimes, which, you know, which totally work. I mean, Dr. Klein's a very good organic chemistry teacher, but the way that he describes, let me go back here. The way that he describes a transition state is he said, these are really, you know, fleeting, you know, they're so quick. It's just something that it passes through in order to get to an intermediate and eventually a product. He likens a transition state. And again, I think it's kind of a crude analogy to, you know, if you were jumping up in the air and your friend took a picture of you and then your friend caught a picture of you, you know, at your highest point in the air while you weren't really hovering in the air, but you can look at the picture of it. And that's kind of what, like a tr what a transition state is. It's kind of like the intermediate. It's really quick, but you can like, you know, evaluate it. Um, whereas he said, okay, well, the intermediate is more like you standing on top of the desk. You know, if you were to jump up in the air, but you jumped on top of a desk, well, you can actually be on the desk longer. Um, anyhow, which again, and you can see how I'm kind of grasping at it here because it is kind of a crude analogy. But the bottom line is that we're not going to be able to isolate any transition states. Intermediates can be observed, you know, for longer periods of time, but we're also not going to isolate those. We're going to go to our product. But anyhow, the reason we have to bring this up at this point in the lecture is because you got to know what I mean when I say a transition state, and you got to know what I mean when I say intermediate, because they're going to come up once we start looking at mechanisms in detail in, you know, really the second half of this chapter. So let's get back into it here. So the transition state, and this is just in a nutshell, is the high energy state of that the reaction passes through. Um, a transition state is fleeting. You can't directly observe it. You can't isolate it. You can't put it in a jar or a bottle. And what's crazy about a transition state is it's kind of like where bonds are breaking and forming simultaneously. Right? What's going on here is you have this molecule. It's called methyl bromide, and it's reacting with a chloride. So the chloride is reacting in a way that it's forming a bond, right? Because you end up with methyl chloride in the end. But the transition state is where, and I'll zoom in here, it's where the bond forming between the carbon and the chlorine is occurring and where the bond breaking between the carbon and the bromine is occurring, okay? Now, if you're thinking, whoa, 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 Mr. Dion, we got a problem here. We got five bonds drawn to carbon. Remember, this is not a bond and this is not a bond, okay? This represents the transition state. That's what this double dag, we call that the double dagger. Kind of fancy, right? The double dagger. Sounds like a... I don't know, maybe a restaurant or something. Anyhow, the double dagger uh, in the square brackets like these, that represents a transition state. It's used all the time in organic chemistry. Okay, so that's a transition state. So um, again, the transition states are the maxima and they represent the transitions as bonds are being formed and broken. Where am I here? Did I go the wrong way? No, I went back too far. Here we are, an intermediate is an intermediate species formed during the course of the reaction. These are the minima. Intermediates, we're not going to take an, an intermediate and put it in a bottle either, but intermediates can be observed, okay? They do exist for a period of time before reacting further. So again, transition state, boom, really quick. You know, it's something that it just passes through, whereas an intermediate can be observed, but you're never going to put that in a bottle either. It's just something else that it passes through. But intermediates are, you can see they're lower in potential energy. Anyhow, so again, the whole concept of transition state in intermediate is going to come up a whole heck of a lot of times in this class. Okay, now I promised you several times today that I would talk to you about something called the Hammond postulate. I want you to take a deep breath here before we look at the Hammond postulate because the Hammond postulate comes up at just the funniest times in organic chemistry. You know, uh, I'll just be lecturing, you know, talking about something, and then the Hammond postulate will come up, okay, kind of out of midair, you know, out of nowhere. So it's one of those concepts that does come up from time to time in organic chemistry, and you don't want to have to go back and look at it every time. So let's see if we can all get it the first time here, and I know you can, okay? Let's go back to this reaction. We looked at this, you know, when we I showed you a picture of a transition state a few minutes ago. Son of a gun, which was, I shouldn't have touched that part of the slide, right? Uh, there we go, which is this guy right here. There's our transition state. Well, the whole idea is this, is that if you have two points, 
on an energy diagram, okay, like these two points here, okay, and they could have picked two points that are even closer. It doesn't matter, but you pick two spots that are close. The idea is that the closer the spots are, or the closer the points on the curve are, the more closely they should be related in terms of their structure, right? So you see these two spots along the curve, right? The maximum, you see that this bond is half formed, this bond, you know, half broken, right? Then you see as you progress a little bit more, right? More of this is broken and this is getting close, it's getting shorter. So it's getting more formed with quotations around that. So again, all we're talking about so far is that if you have two points on the curve, the closer they are together, right? The more they should resemble each other. So based on this assumption, and I'm going to read this right off of the slide, based on this assumption, we can make a generalization about the transition state, right? The transition state is the maximum. This is the TS, the transition state. So based on the Hammond postulate, which is the, the closer two points are on the curve, the more they should resemble each other, um, we can make a generalization about the structure of the transition state depending on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, okay? Now, is this an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? This is an exothermic reaction, isn't it? Because the products are more stable. Well, if I look at my transition state, is my transition state, and this is a question to you guys, and I, I just, it's not a trick question. I just want you to think about this. Is my transition state going to look more like my reactants or will it look more like my products? That's my question. Should it look more like the reactants or more like the products based on the Hammond postulate? Exactly, Mackenzie, 100% correct. It should look more like the reactants. And this isn't a stretch. You can just see that the transition state is closer to the reactants than it is to the products. The products are further away. Okay, so for an exothermic reaction, the transition state is gonna more closely resemble the reactants. You can imagine that if you have an endothermic reaction like this, the transition state's going to more closely resemble the products. That's it. Okay. I mean, you can all see that this, these two green squares or whatever at the top, the one on the left is closer to the reactants and the one on the right is closer to the products. That's the Hammond postulate. And if you're like, well, of course, I can see these green squares are closer, you know, uh, that's all the Hammond postulate is. It's nothing more than that. Okay. Now I'm going to kind of leave it at that for now because we're going to look at the Hammond postulate in more detail later on. But again, the bottom line for you up until this point in this class, all you need to know is that the Hammond postulate states that in an exothermic reaction, the transition state is going to more, look more like the reactants. And in an endothermic reaction, the transition state is going to look more like the products. That's it. Okay. Well, with that in mind, Let's turn our attention to section 6.7. Now, like I told you, this is kind of like part two, okay? This is like part two of chapter six. The first six parts are kind of like the general chemistry two slash introduction almost. And then from section 6.7 on, this is where we get into the real hardcore, you know, organic chemistry. But before we get into section 6.7, here's what we want to be able to do is organic chemistry students. You want to be able to, like your ultimate goal as an organic chemistry student is to be able to look at a molecule on paper and say, you know, this is what I think would happen. You know, if this molecule was subjected to, you know, this reagent, this is what I think would happen. Okay. So just by looking at a structure, you can make an inference. And that's one of the best things about organic chemistry, in my opinion, okay? Now, this opinion, I've learned, is not shared by all people, okay? But when I was a student, long, long time ago, I remember being in my first year university and, you know, talking to some people who were in their second year and, and, and they were taking organic chemistry. And uh, they were telling me how, how difficult organic chemistry was. I didn't know anything about organic chemistry. Hadn't learned anything about it at all yet. But I remember them saying, and I said, well, what makes it so difficult? Why is organic chemistry so difficult? Now, these are students. So you got to take what they were saying with a grain of salt. But they said, well, you know how in, or in general chemistry, you use a calculator for everything, especially in Gen Chem too. I mean, come on, all you're doing is a 
calculations after calculations, right? I said, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, or I know that. Yeah. They said, well, in organic chemistry, you never have a calculator. You almost never use a calculator for anything, okay? And if there is a calculation, you could do it in your head or do it on a napkin, you know? You could do it on this piece of scratch paper. And I was like, whoa. But it turns out that that's something that I liked about organic chemistry. And that's something that I hope you will appreciate as a student is that if you learn the principles that we're going to look at in the next few, you know, short weeks in this class, just by le learning a few concepts, you will be able to look at a molecule and rather quickly be able to say, hey, I think this would happen or I think that would happen. And that is one of the coolest things about organic chemistry, in my opinion. So where that kind of starts is right here with what are called nucleophiles and electrophile, right? Let's say you were an audiophile. If anybody here is an audiophile, if anybody in the class is an audiophile, uh, I don't know if I could classify myself as an audiophile. Probably not. I don't have an expensive stereo. But, you know, audiophiles are people that are into maybe expensive stereo equipment and, I don't know, have fancy speakers or headphones and things like that. And that's, you know, so you know what the word file means, okay? So a nucleophile, what we're going to see is a nucleophile is something that loves nuclei and an electrophile is something that loves electrons all right so ionic or polar reactions are going to occur when an area has an or when one reactant has an area of high electron density and another reactant has an area of low electron density so again what we're going to look for are regions of high electron density in regions of low electron density. Now, if you're wondering how the heck am I going to figure that out, I'll show you. And trust me, you'll, you'll have it figured out pretty quick. But the whole concept of ionic or polar reactions, there are other types of reactions in organic chemistry. We also have pericyclic reactions, which we don't cover in this class at all. And then we have radical reactions, which are covered in chapter 10. But 95% or more of what we cover in organic chemistry are going to be ionic or polar reactions. And so this is going to be really handy for you. So how do I know when I have a region of high electron density in my molecule? And how do I know when I have a region of low electron density? Well, first of all, you know, why do I have to be concerned about regions of high and low electron density? I'll tell you why. Because if you have a negative and a positive charge, what's going to happen? They're going to be attracted to one another, aren't they, right? We know because of Coulomb's law that positive and negative um, electrostatic, uh, there's an electrostatic attraction between something that's positively charged and negatively charged. So that means that an electron rich species, since electrons are negative, if it's electron rich, that means it's going to be a lot more negative. Electron rich species are going to be attracted to something that is electron deficient. Let's take a look at these two molecules down here. We have methyl chloride and methyl lithium. What do they have in common? They both have a CH3, don't they? But they're very different molecules when you look at their electrostatic potential maps, their EPMs. The electronegativity of carbon is around 2.5. Okay, The electronegativity of chlorine is around 3.0. So you've got a polar bond here, right? Everybody in this class should know that you should draw the dipole in the direction of the chlorine, right? Since it's all red up here, that tells you that most of the electron density is up here. This is the delta negative, right? The chlorine is the delta negative. You could write delta minus up here. What does that tell you? That tells you that the carbon is electron poor. It's electron deficient, put another way. Or to put it the way that we're going to put it in organic chemistry, we say the carbon is electrophilic. What does that mean? It's an electron lover. It wants electrons. Why does it want electrons? Because it's partially positive, right? It's delta, uh, a different color here. It is delta plus. It is starved. It is saying, give me electrons. I want them, okay? If we look at methyl lithium, it's still got the CH3, but if we look at the electronegativity of lithium, lithium has an electronegativity around 1.0. So that means we still have a dipole, but the dipole is going in the opposite direction. Now our carbon is delta minus, okay? And you can clearly see that from the electrostatic potential map. What does that mean? It means now in methyl lithium, you have a carbon that is not starved for electrons. It's electron rich, okay? It's got more than enough electrons and therefore it's gonna be nucleophilic. It's gonna love nuclei. It's gonna wanna be in contact with the nucleus. Why? What's a nucleus? A nucleus is 
consists or consists of protons and neutrons. A nucleus is positively charged. So if you have something that's delta minus, it's going to be attracted to something that's delta plus. So what you're going to see is if you were to combine methyl lithium and methyl chloride, there would be a reaction. So again, and I'm rehashing it here, but I want you to get this, you know, kind of straight before we move on, is that your goal, and again, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to happen, you know, you're not going to snap your fingers or 30 minutes later, you'll, you'll know everything. But is to be able to look at molecules like these and say, well, methyl chloride, that's going to be an electrophile. Methyl lithium is going to be a nucleophile. And an electrophile is going to react with a nucleophile. And we're going to see that. So again, what does the nucleophile mean? It means it's a nucleus lover. It's electron rich. It can donate a pair of electrons. It's essentially a Lewis base, right? A Lewis acid was an electron acceptor. A Lewis base is an electron donor. So again, a nucleophile is a type of Lewis base. Where would I find a nucleophile? Well, we already looked at methyl lithium, and I explained why that would be a nucleophile. What about an alkoxide like ethyl oxide? I mean, you've got three lone pairs on the oxygen, and you've got a negative charge. But we said that the whole idea was that it's going to be seeking a nucleus, which is positive. If you have a negative charge, don't you think that's going to want to be or be attracted to a positive charge? Of course it will. Now, ethanol is also nucleophilic in certain situations, right? Because you have two lone pairs here. So those pairs of electrons can be donated to a nucleophile. Okay, it's not as strong as the ethoxide because it doesn't have a negative charge, but it can be a nucleophile. And also we're gonna see many cases throughout this class, especially in chapter nine, where a pi bond can be a nucleophile, right? Remember a pi bond is weaker than a sigma bond. So if you put the pi bond, this bond, if you put it in the presence of a strong enough electrophile, it'll react, okay? Now something else here, I saw the word polarizable when I was reading this slide, it says, the more polarizable a nucleophile is, the stronger it will be. Polarizability refers to the ability of an electron cloud to distort itself. So if we were comparing ethanol to ethane thiol, so this is called ethane, ethane thiol. If we were to compare the nucleophilicity or the ability of the oxygen or the sulfur to be a nucleophile, Ethane thiol, the sulfur here is actually a stronger, stronger nucleophile, nucleophile than oxygen in ethanol. Okay, it's a stronger nucleophile than this oxygen. Why? Because if you look at um, um, uh, group six in the periodic table, you see it goes oxygen, sulfur. Well, sulfur is in the third period, oxygen is in the second period. Sulfur is a bigger atom, and the bigger that an atom is, the greater ability it has to distort its electron cloud, and therefore it can warp itself, for lack of a better word. You'll never find the word warp in an organic chemistry textbook, but it can, I don't know, change its shape. You know, it can, it can morph itself or distort its electron cloud to go seek a nucleus. All right, there we go. Now back to an electrophile is an electron lover. It's electron deficient. An electrophile is a Lewis acid, right? Remember, a Lewis acid was an electron acceptor. So an electrophile is looking for electrons. Now, how would I recognize an electrophile? Well, there's two main types of electrophiles that you're going to encounter in organic chemistry. The first one, I'll go with the second one first, is a carbocation. Okay, if you have a positive charge on a carbon, well, of course, it's going to be starved for electrons. It's getting a whole empty P orbital. It's like, gimme, gimme. I want electrons, and I want them now, right? Okay, another consideration would be if you have a polar bond, right? Like the one that we saw in methyl chloride. Okay, well, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so there's a dipole. The chlorine has most of the electron density, which renders the carbon electron deficient. So in the right situation, it's going to act as an electron file or an electron lover. All right, so there we go. So what have we done so far in section 6.7? I'm going kind of slow, but I want to make sure we get these concepts down pat. So if I have to repeat myself a little bit, so be it. Okay, no big deal. NBD. Let's take a look at this table, which comes directly from our textbook. And it discusses or kind of summarizes, I should say, the types of nucleophiles and um, electrophiles that we're, we're, we're going to see. So nucleophilic centers and electrophilic centers. In this, I would say it's probably not 
exhaustive, but it's a pretty dang good summary of what we're going to see in our class. Everything will be here. So how do you know when you've got a nucleophile? Okay, well, the first one is the inductive effect. If you've got a strongly polar bond and you've got, you know, a lot of negative density on a carbon that can behave as a nucleophile. It's not only carbon that can behave as a nucleophile, obviously. Um, another one would be a lone pair, okay, or a pi bond. I would even add to here, you know, if you have a negative charge, right? Um, you could even put this here in the lone pair, okay? If you have a lone pair and you've got a negative charge, that's going to be a good nucleophile. And then in terms of electrophiles, well, again, a Uh, for electrophiles, it can be an inductive effect that produces an electrophile. Here you have a polar bond between carbon and chlorine, right? So since the dipole is going in the direction of the chlorine, the carbon is electron deficient, and also a carbocation would make a good electrophile. So these are things that we're going to see over and over and over in this class. I'm going to skip this question for now, where it says label all the nucleophilic and electrophilic sites on the molecule and come back to it a little bit later. And I'm sure that you could label, could any, I'll just ask you quickly, um, before, and I don't want to cover the entire thing. Could anybody identify a nucleophilic site on here? And it's not a trick. And I know it's not easy to describe over Microsoft Teams, but could anybody kind of identify one area that would be a nucleophile in this whole dang thing here? Just a nucleophile, anything that would be a nucleophile in here. What about the atoms that have lone pairs on them? Yeah, I see Mackenzie says the oxygen with the negative charge. Oh, you bet your bobby socks, right? That is definitely a nucleophile, isn't it? I'll circle that and I'll write nucleophile. Okay, definitely a nucleophile. I'd say that anything that's got a lone pair, right? This could be a nucleophile. You got a lone pair in the oxygen. That could be a nucleophile. The thing is, and if it's a knee jerk reaction for you to say, well, then this would be a nucleophile too, because there's lone pairs here. That actually won't be a nucleophile. Okay. The reason why that's not really going to be nucleophilic is because there's such a strong dipole here. It actually renders this carbon partially positive and this is partially negative. So this would actually make a good electrophile electrophile. And the same thing here, since we have such a polar bond here, this carbon is delta, sorry, yeah, the carbon is delta plus, right, because you can draw a resonance structure like this. So this carbon is ultra electrophilic. Electrophilic. I don't think that's the easiest question to start off with, and we're going to look at more examples of nucleophiles and electrophiles in the class.